Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Sunday the 13th of March. Now, we've got some pretty good figures on excess deaths for the pandemic period now, and it, it's well in excess of 18 million. It was just over 18 million by the end of uh, 2021, and that's compared to an official uh, death rate of, uh, of about 6 million altogether for the, for the world. So it looks like about 18 million people, and, and unfortunately still counting, uh, are the excess deaths as a result of this pandemic. Now let's look at how this was derived. Now this is a fully peer-reviewed paper from The Lancet. All there, you can download the PDF for yourself, completely available. Um, and this is, comes from the Institute of Health Metrics from Washington State, uh, Washington University. Um, it's an independent agency within the university and the data is actually available there if you wanted to um, if you wanted to have a, a dive into the data yourself. So let's look at this and where it's, where it's come from. So it's estimating excess mortality. There are all the references we strive to be evidence-based at least. Um, so it's January, that's the very start of the pandemic, isn't it? January 2020. And the data's up to the end of 2021, so no 2022 data in there. Estimating excess mortality from the pandemic, 191 countries and, and territories. It's an impressive piece of work, this. I'm glad I didn't have to peer review it. Let me just show you some of the, uh, let me just show you some of the, uh, the, the, the graphics, the graphics here. Um, I mean, th th these are all the, the countries and lots of figures about them. There's just pages and pages of it. Must have, must have been a nightmare to peer review, but, but it is all fully done. So if you want particular data on particular parts of the world, um, it, it's all there and it's all, it's all readily available, free to download. Um, so lots of area, 12 states in India, no, there's a 28 states in India, so they didn't get the full India data. What they did have to do in some, place, some parts of this, they used quite clever statistical models to, uh, to interpolate uh, and to some extent extrapolate uh, data where it was missing. All the details are in the, uh, in, in the article. I don't pretend to understand them all because I'm not a statistician, but it all looks pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So data collected for the pandemic period and past 11 years. So sometimes it's 11 years. Now, Office for National Statistics, for example, in the UK, when, when that's giving data on excess mortality, it's the average for the last five years that it takes. So this went further where the data was available. And quite often there was a certain amount of data available. All-cause all, all mortality reports, excess mortality over time was calculated as observed mortality minus expected mortality. Now, this is, this, is, this is quite good, but this is the way they did it. So the excess mortality, the number of people that died more than normal, equals to the observed mortality minus the expected mortality. So what they actually saw, take away what they expected, was the excess mortality. So quite, um, qu quite, quite clever, really, and quite sophisticated the way they collected this for so many areas. Major piece of work. They accounted for late registrations. They used different models, and they accounted for heat waves and other factors. Really quite impressive, actually. Uh, finding, uh, findings as measured by excess mortality. So as of the end of 2021, there was basically 6 million people reported to have died of COVID. Uh, their estimates for the excess mortality is three times that. It's 18.2 uh, million. Now, this doesn't tell us what they died of. Does this mean that deaths from COVID were greatly underreported? Yeah, to some, well, certainly we know that's true in many parts of the world. Or does it tell us that other people died uh, as results of the lockdown measures or as other measures that were taken to fight the pandemic? Or is it that there was more uh, violence or is it that there was more uh, alcohol and drug abuse? Or is it that, uh, and this is certainly true again, that, that many people were not able or to, were too frightened to access health care? So it doesn't tell us that. It just tells us these, these numbers. But the estimates it gives, um, again, based on quite sophisticated uh, modelling, and I must say the modelling in the United States, certainly in Washington State University, does seem to be better than, let's just say, some institutions that could be mentioned in the UK where our modelling has been, well, um, suboptimal at times. But, but the... Um, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation does seem pretty good. So excess mortality, 17.1 to 19.6 million. Global all age rate of excess mortality due to the pandemic is 123, sorry, 120.3 deaths per 100,000 of the population. 
excess mortality rate exceeded 300 deaths per 100,000 of a population in a, of the population in 21 countries, which we'll, we'll look at. Now let's look num numbers. This is numbers first of all. Cumulative excess deaths due to COVID-19. Now this is numbers. India for uh, four million people, but of course India has got a population of um, one point. 1.4 billion so obviously you would expect that to be highest united states 1.13 million and remember this is excess deaths as calculated this is not uh, that which is recorded in official data it's as calculated russia uh one just over a million mexico 798 100,000, Brazil 792, Indonesia 73,600,000, six Pakistan 664,000. I'm not going to do these in great detail, but um, th these are going down in order, of course. Bangladesh 413,000, Peru 349,000, South Africa 302,000, pretty high death rate in South Africa, really. Uh, Iran, Egypt, it Italy, Italy really quite um, high, surprisingly high, 259,000 people in Italy, 169,000 excess deaths in the UK. Uh, Canada, New Zealand, now New Zealand and Australia, notice these are negatives. They're both negatives. So the excess deaths in New Zealand during the pandemic period were 827 less than you would expect. And in Australia, it was 18,100 less than you would expect. So they're the only countries I found on the list that are in negative uh, territories. And then more in terms of per capita. So excess mortality per 100,000. So excess mortality was highest in Russia uh, 300, uh, 374.6 deaths per 100,000 of the population. Mexico was next, uh, 433, then Brazil, then the United States, 179.3 per 100,000, UK, 126.8, Canada, 60.5, and again, Australia and New Zealand, both in negative territory with less people dying than would be expected. Now, um, I was surprised that India wasn't in this because we did look at these horrific uh, videos and horror stories from India of the people being buried along the Ganges and terrible things like that. Um, but that's because of the very large population in India. Um, actually, the, the most deaths um, per 100,000 were in, in Russia. We have suspected it was high, but we didn't know it would come out uh, the worst of the bunch. Uh, well, the highest, the highest, of course, is the worst. Um, now, that is what this data is showing. W it reminds me of videos we've done over the past couple of years, actually, where we did anticipate some of this. But th there are always surprises. Um, but the Russia is not too much of a surprise. Uh, ratio of excess mortality rate due to COVID-19 mortality. Now, how wrong did people get it? A measure of the undercounting of the true pandemic mortality. So Morocco undercounted their deaths by a factor of 10. So if, if, you, if you assume that the, uh, the excess deaths is the right number of deaths and the number that are actually reported, then there was actually 10 times more excess deaths in Morocco. Uh, compared to the actual reported number of deaths. Egypt, it was 12.9. Sudan, it was 25 times. So 25 times more actual excess deaths in Sudan than officially reported from, uh, from COVID-19. Afghanistan, as you would expect, high. Yemen, of course, is a war-torn country, so um, some of those could have been due to the war, as well as massive underreporting, of course. Canada, 1.44. Four. So Canada only slightly underreporting. United States, one one point three seven. The United Kingdom actually slightly under, under underreporting. Now the interpretation of this, um, the full in, the direct quote from the authors: the full impact of the pandemic has been much greater than what is indicated by reported deaths due to COVID-19 alone. We, we know this. We've known this for a while, but we didn't realise it was times three higher globally so it is a lot and further research is warranted to work out what the heck is going on is it caused by collateral damage or is it or is COVID-19 and its various uh, various strains various waves been more pathogenic than we had uh, than we originally thought so things still to be worked out there um, 
do remember the the average death age in the UK is 82.5 years of age so this is still primarily affecting older people as we know and uh, if we just look at the couple of figures from the United from the United Kingdom here so this this is where COVID-19 was the underlying cause of death so this is the deaths from COVID or the deaths with COVID so these are the deaths from COVID these are the latest figures about 75% would have carried on living had it not been for the COVID episode and about 25% dying with COVID that's in the UK but of course, we have to bear in mind, as we've said, that the average age of death with COVID in the UK is 82.5 uh, years of age. So I think it's sometimes useful to look at the amount of years of life lost. And clearly, because it's older people, uh, predominant, predominantly older people dying, the years of life lost are less. Whereas with the uh, the First World War, which people are making analogies with, so 15 to 22 million people died in the First World War, but they were mostly young combatants. And if, if you walk down the, the war graves in France, as, as I do from time to time, and you read the ages, um, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, typical, very, very young men typically. So a lot of years of life were lost there. And... Um, yeah, I, I go there every, every few years. If, if, you, if you've never been to the war graves, do, do try and go. I, I always have to walk off up and down the rows by myself, and I always, I always cry every time. It's such an impact. You know, if, if you want, if you want to know a little about the nature of war, albeit in that uh, very neatly groomed circumstance, do go to the war graves if you possibly can. Which of course reflects current situations as well, doesn't it? But the point is, I'm making that was mostly young men, so so they lost a lot of a lot of uh, life in World War Two. Of course, there was massive civilian casualties. Um, 1918, 19 pandemic. Again, a lot of younger people died. There was an excess of deaths in the teenage years as well as in the older years in the 1918, 19 pandemic. So much less years of life have been lost. But we still need to know much more. So, but looking back, uh, aren't, aren't we fortunate that this virus didn't uh, selectively kill children, for example? Um, it, it, it's not impossible that that could have happened, but it didn't. Uh, so we, we need to work out whether it's uh, to distinguish excess mortality that was directly caused by sars coronavirus 2 or the chances of deaths indirect. And, and, and another thing that's probably going, well, is going to happen is... Um, there's almost certainly going to be an increase in cancer deaths over the next few years, probably everywhere, from people that didn't seek health care during the pandemic and delayed uh, diagnosis. So th these repercussions are to, going to be with us for years, years to come. But anyway, getting back to the to and from, that was that figure. And then I think the other thing to bear in mind is, is this, this is UK data, so we can't extrapolate this to the world, of course. But uh, the proportion of uh, comorbidities. So in the UK, the most common one was, um, that, that's 30%, that's 20%. It's so about, what, 22% of people dying had diabetes as a comorbidity. And these other comorbidities here, as well as age, of course. And uh, again, still about 17% COVID-19 cases with no uh, pre-existing uh, health conditions. So... Um, there we go. Um, excess mortality over 18 million. Now, of course, we're now um, two and a half months into 2022. So, so this number, uh, this number will increase. Interesting to think about. So given that we, we don't really know how many of these deaths are COVID attributable and how many aren't, will we ever know this? Probably not. Is it, is it true or is it possible that more people died of the measures that we took to restrict the spread of COVID-19 than actually died of COVID-19 from these excess deaths? That is possible. I don't think that's going to be true. I think a lot of these deaths are um, underreported COVID-19, but there will be a large proportion, as we've said, of, of uh, deaths caused by the, imp the measures that were taken and, and devastating economic uh, impacts in, in some in some parts of the world so whether we'll ever have a full breakdown on that is doubtful we might have more accurate estimates uh, in time but the key thing is really that we, we learn from this pandemic for the next one because there will be a next one and um, 
and and it could it could affect it could affect much um much younger people it could be much more deadly as we've said many times it could be as transmissible as measles and as deadly as uh, middle east respiratory syndrome which um, has got a very high mortality rate or as deadly as, as ebola that is possible and of course in the current climate the other thing that's really concerning i mean we've debated many times on this channel whether the um the sars coronavirus 2 came from a lab or not um from the data that we can get, unless our intelligence services are completely lying to us, um, which I suppose isn't entirely impossible, but, but I don't think there's any strong data to suggest that they are. I don't think, and most, micro, most virologists around the world don't seem to be jumping up and down about this. I don't think this is a bioengineered virus. I don't think it was designed in a lab to be a, 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 a pathogenic virus. Um, whether there was gain of function research um, to study the virus is much more probable. Whether the virus accidentally escaped from a, a, a lab, possibly in Wuhan, I, I, is quite possible. Whether we'll ever know that again, um, I don't really know that. But what, what is concerning is we do believe that um, virological institutes around the world have engineered viruses. Um, and this could be in Russia, it could be in the United States, it could be in the United Kingdom, it could be anywhere uh, that are actually biological, could, could be used as biological warfare agents. And human beings are quite capable uh, of designing a virus that is, is capable of eradicating, well, I don't know, 90% of the world's population in a few months without being too alarmist about it. If it was designed to do that, I suspect it probably it probably could do that. that. That's quite an alarming, an alarming possibility. Uh, we know that um, smallpox um, it, it is kept. The, the, the smallpox in Port and Down in the UK that is that is known. That is known. And of course, we have to keep smallpox because if the bad guys release smallpox uh, as, as as a chemical as, as a biological weapon, we would need our smallpox supply to um, put that into uh, cellular, cellular cultures so that we could produce our own modern up-to-date vaccines so we need to keep smallpox because the the bad guys are produce are, are keeping smallpox but of course the bad guys who might think they're good guys are keeping smallpox because they think we're the bad guys and we're keeping smallpox so no state secret the smallpox and um, i'm sure there's the smallpox in a couple of places in the states stored in the lab of course and um and, and certainly in the uk and there has actually been um, the odd episode of uh, escape so it, it, it is a concern. But it, apart from that, the, the possibility of another zoonotic uh, pandemic um, is, is a certainty. Uh, it's just a case of, of when. So hopefully we've learned something from it. Although so far, I don't see too much indication that we have. What probably ha we have, what we have done is certainly in the UK, we've, we've instigated and accelerated more vaccine production facility. And uh, Canada, for example, which had no indigenous uh, vaccine production capacity at all, I believe they've now uh, or they're now instigating some. So vaccine production um, should be quicker next time. Um, but um, whether we've learned from other things like. I mean, I don't want to go over too much, but, you know, it was back in January, February 2020 on this channel, we'll be saying close all flights from China close all flights from China. If that had been done, we probably wouldn't have had a pandemic. But the World Health Organization said, go ahead. So uh, have they learned from the mistakes? Well, maybe the first step to learning from the mistakes might be admitting their mistakes. And there's no sign of that, really. So just a few uh, <laughs> few reflections. Um, I suspect most of you have switched off by now. But if you're still here, <laughs> thank you for watching.